Yeah. Ah. What the fuck, Ted? May the force be with you. Yeah. What are you doing? <laughs> you just stabbed me in the in the chest. Come on, man. Star Wars review. It's lightsaber battle. Remember? We only do that for the episodic movies, man. This is an anthology. <laughs> well, it, it's Star Wars, man. You know, uh. lightsabers. You and Aaron did it for Rogue One. That's an anthology. Yeah, but that's like <laughs> it's, it's episode three point eight. It's basically episodic. All right, man. I figured Star Wars lightsaber. I figured you'd be with you'd be with it. Just get in the car and call a doctor. Oh, all right. You know, by the way, the uh, car's running, so let's get you patched up quick. Throw some ice on it. Uh, yeah, I need gas money too. I've been running scams on the street since I was ten. <laughs> Star Wars, a solo story. Solo, a Star Wars movie. So, solo, I, I don't know. I don't know the name of this. Today I am here to review Solo, a Star Wars story. The new Star Wars film set in the galaxy far, far away. Now, Solo was a movie that everyone was itching for. Everybody wanted to know what Han Solo was doing before he found himself in that low-life Mos Eisley cantina on Tatooine. Han Solo, I'm Captain of the Millennium Falcon. Chewie here tells me you're looking for passage to the Alderaan system. You know that old saying, all press is good press? I think Lucasfilm was trying to disprove that theory with Solo. It feels like nothing but drama has surrounded the production of Solo, the change of directors, firing Lord and Miller, bringing on Ron Howard, basically reshooting the entire movie, ballooning the budget, there were questions surrounding the film's cast, and many fans found the whole endeavor to be unnecessary to begin with. At the center of all the controversy was Alden Ehrenreich, a relatively unknown actor who was cast to play the titular character Han Solo. Rumors spread that the young actor was struggling so much with the role of Han Solo that he needed an acting coach on set while filming, something that is actually quite common in Hollywood. I always believe that Alden Ehrenreich was set up to fail by him being cast in the first place. Han Solo is a role that is synonymous with Harrison Ford, and trying to replace Harrison Ford as Han Solo is nearly impossible, because Harrison Ford was basically just playing himself in the original trilogy. <laughs> But to my surprise, Alden's younger version of Han Solo was the best part of this movie. Instead of doing a Harrison Ford impression, Alden brought his own swagger to the character. Initially, I did have Han Solo Uncanny Valley. The first few scenes, I kept thinking to myself, who's this guy? That's not Han Solo, but he quickly settles into the role. His performance is more like a remix of the character than an impersonation. What you loved about the original is still there. You can still spot the quirks and charms of Han Solo, the facial tics, body movements, and mannerisms that were initially inspired by Harrison Ford. But like Harrison Ford before him, Alden injected his own charm and charisma into the character, and that's what makes Han Solo relatable. He's an everyman. He's a little arrogant, a little clumsy. Sometimes he's a good guy, sometimes he's a bad guy, but it's impossible for him to hide his big heart behind his goofy charm. So whereas I thought Alden would be the worst part of a bad situation, he ended up being the best part of a pretty good situation. You know, pretty good. The story operates within a three-year gap, anywhere from ten years after Revenge of the Sith to ten years before A New Hope. We begin with Han Solo as a low-life street hustler on the mean streets of Corellia, a planet that has been swamped in corruption since the Empire came to power. Here we are introduced to Han Solo's first love, Kira played by Amelia Clark. Kira is also a street hustler, and the two run jobs for the local mob boss, Lady Proxima, hoping to one day escape the planet and leave their lives of poverty behind. Lady Proxima continues the Star Wars tradition of disgusting and disturbing-looking alien creature mob bosses who dominate the Star Wars underworld. There's nothing that creeps me out more than critters with dozens of legs. You only need two legs, really. Look at me. I'm a cricket. I got two legs, two antennas. Romance has always played a major role in Star Wars. The relationship between Anakin and Padme was the driving force behind the prequel trilogy. The relationship between Han and Leia was the heart of the original trilogy. And in a way, Amelia Clark, like Alden Ehrenreich, had a decent amount of pressure on her to really bring her A-game in this movie. Star Wars fans were going to see Kira and think, oh no Han, she ain't right for you. She don't deserve you. But Han and Kira's relationship turned out to be the driving force behind Han's motivations in this movie. Not only were Kira and Han lovers, but they were friends. Two kids who grew up in the gutter together. The relationship they had was built on a mutual understanding of the hardships they both faced together. 
A lot of what happens between Han and Kira in this movie influences Han's outlook on life and personality in the original trilogy. We get a better understanding as to why he developed his devil-may-care jaded attitude towards everything that he cannot control. The chemistry between Han and Kira was a change of pace from the hard-to-get love-hate playfulness between Han and Leia. Han and Kira are in love from the very first time we see them on screen, and their relationship becomes more complex as the story progresses. And I don't want to get bogged down in only comparing Kira to Leia. Kira stands on her own from any Star Wars character. She can swindle and maneuver with the best of the Star Wars underworld. And it was nice to see Amelia Clark step from under the shadow of Daenerys Targaryen. I love her as Daenerys, but sometimes I feel like they don't utilize her acting abilities. It looked like she was having a really good time in this movie. Dire circumstances made Han and Kira dependent on one another in their youth until they are tragically separated in the beginning of the movie, and their ability to survive is what defines them both. Eventually, they do cross paths again under the similar circumstance of fighting to survive in the Emperor's galaxy, and the inevitable deterioration of their relationship is a bit heartbreaking. Eventually, Han gets off the planet Corellia and enlists in the Imperial Army. He wants to be a pilot, something that was taken from Legends, but he's relegated to being a foot soldier during one of the Empire's planetary occupations. This is where he first meets Tobias Beckett, played by Woody Harrelson, and his crew of bandits, which include characters played by Tandy Newton and John Favreau. Fans initially thought Woody Harrelson would be portraying Garish Strike, a character from Star Wars Legends who serves as a mentor and surrogate parent for Han, teaching him the ways of intergalactic smuggling. In this version of Solo's origins, Tobias Beckett is more like a weekly tutor than a mentor. The two characters only know each other for a couple of days. I did enjoy their brief teacher-pupil relationship. For Han, looking at Tobias must feel like looking in a mirror that lets you see yourself in 30 years. Tobias is basically what Han Solo was once destined to be, a criminal foot soldier working jobs for those who rule the Star Wars underworld. I do wish we had more time to develop the characters of Val and Rio, played by Tandy Newton and John Favreau, the two original members of Beckett's crew. At first, they seemed poised to be great new additions to the Star Wars universe, but their screen time was tragic cut short. During the Empire's occupation of Minban, Han is accused of desertion and is set to be executed. This is where he meets the mighty Chewbacca for the first time, who is being kept as a prisoner slash executioner by the Imperial Army. Han is thrown into Chewbacca's cage, seeing Chewie for the first time all weak and withered, but he soon discovers that Chewie is a force to be reckoned with. And instead of Chewie tearing Han limb from limb, Han devises an escape plan for both of them, and the two runaways join forces with Beckett and his crew. Even more so than Han and Kira, Han and Chewie's relationship was probably the most important factor of making this movie work. You need that chemistry between Han and Chewie. This may be my favorite version of Han and Chewie's relationship. The comedic timing between them was flawless, and this might be the funniest version of Chewbacca we've ever seen. I remember taking one of my friends to see Force Awakens in 2015. He had never seen Star Wars before, and after the movie he was like, Oh, Chewbacca, he's funny, he's like Groot. And I was like, no, motherfucker, Groot is like Chewbacca. This is Jonas Suatamo's first time playing Chewbacca for an entire movie, taking over for the great Peter Mayhew, and his athleticism allows him to maneuver more freely as Chewbacca, so we get to see that full Wookiee strength. Chewie was always like the lovable family dog, but here, he's a fucking badass. He's a sidekick who can rip people's arms from their sockets, he's tossing people in the air, he's just an absolute force of nature. It's also nice to see a Star Wars movie where Chewie actually has something to do, rather than just being used as a comedic punchline. For those of you who are frustrated by Star Wars' apprehension towards breaking with tradition, you'll be happy to hear that there is no villain in Solo. Well, there is a villain, but it's Paul Bettany's character. He's supposed to be the primary antagonist, but he's more like Diet Jabba than a Darth Vader or a Kylo Ren or a Palpatine. Do it. Paul Bettany plays Dryden Voss, who was originally supposed to be played by Michael Kenneth Williams. He is the leader of the Crimson Dawn Criminal Syndicate. He hires Beckett and his crew to steal a shipment of the Hyperfuel Coaxium, which ends up being the train high sequence that we saw in the first trailer. I thought this was going to be the third act, but it's actually at the very beginning, and it goes horribly wrong. This was Han and Chewie's first big job with Beckett's crew, and after it fails, Beckett fears the raft of Dryden Voss. In typical Han Solo fashion, he convinces Dryden Voss to give them another shot. He says that they can steal the coaxium from the spice mines of Kessel. Ooh, make the Kessel run in 12 parsecs. 
Han is then reunited with Kira, who is now working as one of Dryden Voss's lieutenants. She tells Han if they want to successfully rob the spice mines of Kessel, they will need the fastest ship in the galaxy. And the owner of that ship is none other than Lando Calrissian, played by Donald Glover, who suspiciously looks a lot like Childish Gambino. The fundamental difference between the performances of Alden Ehrenreich as Han Solo and Donald Glover as Lando Calrissian is that one guy feels like he's giving us a new iteration of the character we already know, while the other guy seems to just be impersonating the actor who originally played the character. Donald Glover as Lando was a typical 2018 internet fan cast. Everybody wanted him in the role, and everybody was thrilled when it was announced. Some fans even called for him to lead the movie over Alden. His casting was almost too good to be true. It's like if Idris Elba was ever cast to play Jon Stewart. The only problem I would have with his performance is that every time Glover is on screen, he is treading the line between acting and impersonation. The reason his Lando impersonation doesn't come off as goofy or take you out of the movie is because it is pretty good. Donald Glover is a very convincing young Lando Calrissian. He's smooth, he's charismatic, he's well-dressed, and he's constantly looking for ways to cheat the game and change the hand he was dealt. I would say that they did kind of play up his flamboyance, and I understand he was well-dressed in the original trilogy, but he never really talked about it. It was just kind of who he was. He didn't make an effort to convince other people that he was suave or smooth. It was just kind of his identity. And I want to be the first one to make the comparison that droid deaths in Star Wars are now like the direwolf deaths in Game of Thrones. Why does it hurt so much more when a droid dies versus a human? I didn't even like L337, the new droid that acts as Lando's co-pilot. I did find it funny that she low-key wanted to bang Lando. And her death was kind of sad. Kind of felt like Lando wanted to bang her too. How would that work? It works. So this ragtag group of Star Wars characters, new and old, are brought together to rob the spice mines of Kessel. And this is the fundamental problem with the movie. The Kessel run was awesome. When they're in the Maelstrom, that giant cloud, and then they run into this giant fucking squid monster who's just chilling in space, and it was just well directed. All of the action scenes were terrific. The opening car chase scene, the train heist. I have to give credit to Ron Howard. He took over a mess of a situation and delivered a decent film while giving us some incredible action sequences, especially the Kessel run which is one of the best big screen action sequences you will ever see in a movie theater. And Bradford Young, one of the great cinematographers working today, really showed out in this movie. And that's Star Wars tradition. These movies are always gorgeous. The first one ever set the standard for Hollywood blockbusters, and this one is no different. But was any of this necessary? Was this story necessary? The answer is no. It really wasn't. I don't need any more backstory for Han Solo and Lando. I was more than satisfied with what I got in the original trilogy. Smuggler, smuggler, charismatic, charismatic, scruffy, not scruffy. I don't need to see the moment where Han met Chewie, which sounds like a 1980s rom-com that I would totally watch, and Kathleen Kennedy, if she's listening, she's probably like, ooh, we're gonna do that money, money, money. I don't need to see how Han made the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs, something that doesn't even make sense scientifically, and something that I never really understood the meaning of, but it just sounded cool when he said it, so I took his word for it. It's a ship that made the Kessel Run in less than 12 parsecs. This is a ship that made the Kessel Run in 14 parsecs. 12! 14. That's one of the major problems with Star Wars today. They need to take audiences into unknown territory. They even have a thing in Star Wars called the Unknown Regions. And rather than living off material that we already know that's been stretched thin through 11 films, give us something new. Just look at the box office numbers. Solo A Star Wars Story is set to be the lowest opening weekend box office for a Star Wars film yet. But I can't get too worked up because I know they have things planned like the D&D trilogy and Ryan Johnson's trilogy that's going to take us away from the main saga. So those are the films that I'm really anticipating. One of my personal nerdy problems with Star Wars that they seem reluctant to tie in canon when it comes from the books or the TV shows. But I have to say I was not expecting that cameo. Darth fucking Maul. I did not see that coming. Holy shit, what a cameo. Might be the best part of the movie. I, I love Darth Maul. God, I'm such a Star Wars nerd. I think I'm part of the problem. I'm why they keep milking this franchise. Money, 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 money. Give me money. Now, I've seen Clone Wars. Can anyone out there explain to me how Darth Maul survived being cut in half by Obi-Wan Kenobi? I know the Night Sisters patched him up with some mumbo-jumbo magic and gave him bionic legs, but seriously, how... How does one survive being cut in half for 10 years? Because he climbed into a garbage chute, he was clinging on to the Force, and his hatred of Obi-Wan Kenobi kept him alive? 
It's the first time in a Star Wars movie that we don't see C-3PO and R2-D2. It's not the first time where we don't see a lightsaber because I don't know why, but Maul had to force grab his lightsaber and show it to the audience and be like, hey, remember this? It's got two sides. I wasn't underwhelmed by Paul Bettany's character because the real antagonist in Solo is the Galactic Society that has become broken under the Empire. The galaxy under the Empire has become a cesspool of corruption where everyone is fighting to survive. Han, Kira, Beckett, Lando, even Dryden Voss, they all have people they are answering to, and at the end of the day, their main goal is self-preservation. The pacing problems of Solo mirror the pacing problems of Rogue One. Rogue One's first two acts were pretty lackluster in my opinion, but the final battle on Scarif was one of the best third acts in Star Wars history. I usually just kind of skip to the third act when I watch that movie. Solo starts with a bang, but the finish is very cliche and anticlimactic. Everybody just starts betraying one another. Beckett betrays Han, Han betrays Voss, Kira betrays Voss, then Kira betrays Han, Lando betrays everybody, then Beckett kidnaps Chewie, and then Han kills Beckett. It became predictably unpredictable. The badass pirates that we saw in the trailer turned out to be a group of rebel fighters who were also after the hyperfuel coaxium. Han ends up siding with the rebel fighters because it's the right thing to do, but he refuses to join their rebellion. The whole third act just reminded me how much of the mystique was washed away from Han Solo. It makes watching him in A New Hope a little less special now because we know that the Death Star wasn't his big first adventure. When we first see him in A New Hope, he seems to be just making it up as he goes, improvising the rescue mission for Leia, and he's clearly out of his element. Uh, had a slight weapons malfunction. But uh, everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Thank you. How are you? Even his turn at the end where he decides to help Luke destroy the Death Star is a little less special because instead of that being his first true hero moment, we now have this third act that proves Han Solo was a good guy all along, which I guess we already kind of knew. Han was never a terrible person. It's just something that I didn't need to be shown. And I'm not even going to talk about the scene where he gets his name. To me, that's not canon. It's just not canon. Maybe we'll call you Han, isolationist. So overall, I would still give Solo a 7 out of 10. I think it's a good movie. It's a fun ride, albeit an unnecessary one. And hopefully Star Wars will leave these characters where they belong, in the original trilogy. Let them live. Let them breathe. We have their story. They're iconic. We all love them. Just give us something new. What was that? Boba Fett movie? Oh, sign me up. That sounds awesome.